our topic is Isa alayhi salam and Islam and Christianity. Uh, it's a good topic. It's important for us to understand, especially in our, given our context. I want to begin by telling you a true story. I was, uh, used to have fellowship with several churches in the Bay Area. We go and, you know, we have interfaith dialogue. And I was at a church one time. Uh, it was a Methodist church. And usually the United Methodist Church is very welcoming of Muslims. And they really enjoy, you know, learning about different perspectives and things like that. Anyway, I was in the church and uh, after the, after the uh, event, I walked down to the parking lot and a group of really hardcore evangelical Christians uh, ambushed me. Uh, and they were asking me, what are you doing in a church? You're a Muslim. What are you doing here? And I said, well, we're here to have interfaith dialogue. And there's one lady in particular who had a Bible with her. She was very distraught that we were in the church. And uh, she started saying things like, your prophet went into Europe and killed all of the Europeans. I was like, okay, I don't, I don't know who you think my prophet is. But the Prophet وسلم, he did not leave uh, the, the Hejaz, the Arabian Peninsula, in the 23 years of his ministry. Right? Didn't leave the Hejaz. And she said, no, it's well documented. I said, I don't know who documents that. I've never heard of that. And then she quoted a verse from the Quran uh, out of context. Right? You know, فَقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوكُ you know, Kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. She said, look at this verse. And she tried to convince me that Muslims uh, believe in unmitigated, perpetual warfare against unbelievers. So that's what Muslims believe. And I said, you actually believe that's what I believe? And she said, yes. And I said, then it would be my duty right now to kill you. Wouldn't it be? We're not killing you. So obviously that belief, that's not what Muslims believe. And then I, I said to her, you know, you have to look at the context. There's a whole science, you know, when you study the Quran, right? There's ulum al Quran. You have to know nasq, you have to know asbab al nuzul, you have to know logha, you have to know these different types of sciences. So asbab al nuzul, uh, this is a science that relates to the occasions of the revelations. What are the contexts of these ayat? Right? Very, very important. So I said, that verse is contextualized. It's very important to understand the context. Uh, and she said, no, 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 Muslims have to apply this. And I said, well, to give her um, uh, an example of why it's important to look at the context, I said, you know in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus says, those enemies of mine, that do not accept me as their king, bring them hither and slay them before me. So I read this translate. I read this verse, and she didn't understand it because it's kind of strange in English. So I quoted to her the Berenstein Bear translation. Right. So they have a kids' translation, a, a children's translation of the Bible called the Berenstein Bear translation. It's very easy to. So this is what it says in the Berenstein Bear translation. Those who do not accept me as their king cut their throats in my very presence. Right? And then she immediately said, that verse is not in my Bible. I expected her to say, well, there's a context, right? And then I would have made my point. Exactly. Every verse in scripture has a context. But she said, that's not in the Bible. There's no way that verse is in the Bible. So can I, say, I said, can I see your Bible? She gave it to me and I showed her the verse. And she looked at it and she closed it and she looked at the cover as if, you know, it, it was a different book or it was her own Bible. And then she looked at me and she said, I know who you are, Satan. I just thought I'd open with that story. I have a lot of stories, by the way. Maybe I'll, down, down the line, I'll tell you more stories. Very interesting stories. So uh, anyway, she proceeded to do an exorcism on me. She thought I was possessed by a demon. And she's speaking in tongues and things like that. It's happened quite often. It's quite normal now. Anyway, we're talking about Isa alayhi salam. First thing we want to talk about are names. It's important to understand 
uh, the names of prophets, the asma of the anbiya. Because in the names of the prophets, there are certain asrar, certain secrets in the names, right? So the name of the Prophet ﷺ is Muhammad ﷺ. This is a passive participle, right? Ism maf'ul. And it's on the second verbal form, which denotes intensity or repetition and action, right? So one who is always and intensively praised, right? That's his name. It's really interesting. And you can write volumes on, you know, the name of the Prophet ﷺ. But one of the things that the ulama mentioned is, right now, somebody is shouting, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's happening right now. It's actually happening every second of every day, 24 7, around the clock, as long as there are believers on the earth. Somebody is shouting the praises of the Prophet. What a fa'ana laka dhikrak. Right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, out of consolation to his Prophet. There was a wizard, there was a burden on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. And anqada in Arabic means this, to crack. So this is majaz, this is figurative. If I put bricks on this table, the, the legs are going to start buckling and they'll crack. So the back, so there's a very explicit uh, analogy, very graphic analogy. The back of the Prophet ﷺ, it's, it's like it's breaking because of the wizard, the burden of the da'wah of the revelation, that he is the universal messenger, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, we remove that from you and raised high your remembrance. So there's many things we can say about the name of the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi wa The name uh, Ismail, right? Which is pronounced Yishmael in Hebrew. Does anyone know what this name means? Sometimes you read these you're really anti-Muslim polemicist writings that are done by evangelical Christians. And I say, oh, Ismail means something terrible, right? Because they're racist and they don't like the Arabs and they want to justify a war and things like that. But what does his name actually mean? Right? Ismail, Ishmael. Yishma in Hebrew is a fi'l mudari'. It's a present tense verb, right? It means to hear. He hears. Who hears? Ail. Ail in Hebrew means God. Like ilah. God will hear. This is, the, this is the meaning of his name. Ishmael. Ismail, God will hear. Right? Very interesting in the Quran, we're told that Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail السلام, were at the Kaaba and they prayed, Rabbana wab'athihim rasulan minhum. Right? Oh Allah, raise up a messenger amongst them from them. And this dua was answered. The Prophet وسلم, said, Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim wa bisharatu Isa ibn Maryam. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. I am the fulfillment of my father Abraham. And Ismail was there at the time. And the glad tidings, Bushra, that's the meaning of gospel. And the gospel of Isa, alayhi salam. What is the gospel? The coming of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Ismail, Ismail, anytime you see the word E-L, either as a, uh, um, as a suffix um, or in the name somewhere, right? Uh, that's called a theophoric name. A theophoric name means the name of God is embedded in the name. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, the best names are theophoric, like Abdullah, right? You have the Abd prefix, and then Allah, Abdul Rahman, right? Abdul Latif, these are the best types of names. So like um, the name uh, Gabriel, right? Gabriel, right? Jibril, Gavriel in Hebrew, the name of God is in that name. It means the power of God. Right? Or like Elijah or Elroy or L. Ron Hubbard. I'm just, just, just kidding about that one. I apologize to the Scientologists in the room. So theophoric names, right? If you look at a name, uh, Ishaq, another example. What does the name Ishaq mean? In Hebrew, it's pronounced, it's very difficult. Yixhaq, <clears throat> excuse me. Hebrew is very guttural, even much more than Arabic, right? The, the meaning in Hebrew means laughter. It's related to the verb dahika, idhak. That's how you would say it, literally. Why is his name laughter? Because we're told in Surah Hud, and also in the Torah, we're told that when angels came to the house of Ibrahim salam, they said, to, to Sarah, you're going to have a son. She says, Aalidu ana ajuzun, right? Fadahikat. She laughed. 
I'm an old woman and I'm ajuz. This is my husband, he's an old man. This is strange, right? So they named their son Laughter. So the names of prophets are very, very interesting that there's something that happened before their birth or something will happen during their lives or something that's going to happen at the end of their lives, right? That will determine their names. The name Moses is Moshe in Hebrew, which means to draw someone out of something, something extracted. Why does his name mean extracted? Who knows? Huh? Very good. He was extracted from the, the Nil, the Nahru Nil, the, the Nile River. So they call his name Moshe. Now the name Isa alayhi salam, his actual name, according to most scholars of the New Testament, his actual name, because Isa alayhi salam did not speak English, obviously. There was a governor of Texas. This is a true story. You know, God bless our politicians. The first female governor of Texas, her name was Miriam Ferguson. All right, this is, um, I don't know, maybe 100 years ago or something. She was, there was a court hearing. They were going to determine whether they're going to teach Texas school children Spanish, right? And she was against it. So she picked up the King James Version of the Bible. And she said, if English was good enough for Christ, it's good enough for our children. Yes. No, didn't speak English, you know. Um, probably knew a little bit of Koine Greek. The New Testament is in Greek, and that's Im an immediate disadvantage for the Christian because Isa a.s. probably did not speak Greek either. But it's interesting when you look at certain things in the Greek and compare it to the English. Like in Mark 10, 18, this is the Gospel of Mark, right? And we can quote these things. You know, the Prophet sallam, said, Hadithu an bani Israel wa la haraj. Quote the stories of the Israelites, and there's nothing wrong with that, as long as they, they don't contradict our aqidah. So Imam Ghazali, for example, Imam at tabari they'll quote from the Bible. It's sort of like FYI. If they're writing research papers today, they probably put it in footnotes. But someone like Ibn Kathir, he says, don't, don't quote it. It's not necessary. So difference of opinion. Anyway, Mark 10, 18, a scribe comes to Jesus and says, Good master, what must I do to gain eternal life? In the English, he, in, in the English his response is, why do you call me good? There is no one good but one. That is God. Right? Isn't it very clear that he's not God? He doesn't even accept the title of good. But in the Greek, it's even more emphatic. In the Greek, he says, Time leges agathan, udes agathas, eme heis hatheas. So what he does is he brings the object to the front of the sentence. This is called maf'ul muqaddam in Arabic. If you want to emphasize something, right? If you want to say, I hit Zaid, but you want to emphasize, Zaid and Darabtu, Zaid I hit. You bring the maf'ul bihi forward. This is what happens in the Greek. So basically he's saying, me? You're calling good? There's no one good but one, and that is God. Right? Very interesting. Uh, anyway, um, he probably knew a little bit of Koine Greek, probably knew some Latin, maybe. The lingua franca of the Roman Empire at the time in Palestine was Koine Greek, common Greek, right? Which is very different than classical Greek. Yeah, you guys heard of Nietzsche? Um, he quipped one time, he's a big atheist, but he said, he said, it was so nice of God to reveal his word in such a remedial form of Greek right, for our comprehension. Because I, I studied Greek for two years, and then I studied uh, Koine Greek, Biblical Greek. And then I studied uh, the Polyteon by Plato. And I said, whoa, it's a whole new ballgame. Right? <laughs> anyway. Um, what he spoke was a language called Syriac. Syriac. That's the language of Isa. Syriac is also known as Late Aramaic. Okay, it's a kind of a late dialect of a language called Aramaic. Aramaic was a language of the Persian Empire. The Jews were in captivity in Babylon, right? They were taken there by a man named Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. 538, uh, Babylon was conquered by the Persians, King Cyrus, right? Iran number one, just joking. Um, I'm from Iran, so I, I can pick on the Iranians a little bit. Uh, so anyway, the, the, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. Um, and then uh, the Jews, when they returned to Palestine, and many of them did not return, many of them stayed in in, in Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. Some of them actually went into the Hejaz, into Yathrib, 
right? And because there's prophecy that a prophet will come there, right? And the ones that did return into Palestine, Hebrew ceased to be the spoken language. They would pray in Hebrew. It was a liturgical language now. But the spoken language was called Aramaic, right? Which is still a Semitic language. It was related to Hebrew, related to Arabic, right? We call them Semitic languages after Sam, the son of Noah. So according to the Muslim of Ahmad, there's a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, he said that Nuh السلام, had three sons that survived the flood. They're called Sam, Ham, and Japheth. And Sam, he went to the Middle East. So the, the Middle Easterners are his uh, progeny, right? So al lughat samiyat the Semitic languages, they're related in that sense. So he spoke Syriac. So how do you say the name of Isa السلام, in Syriac? It's pronounced Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. What does this name mean? You know, it's interesting. Um, in Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic, are, like we said, it's very closely related. Sometimes the same verbal uh, scale applies across all three languages. So in Arabic, a first form passive participle has an oo sound in the middle of it. it maf'ul. Do you hear that oo? The wow. Maf'ul. That means it's passive participle. That means an action is done to it. Right? So the katib is the active participle, the one writing. The maktub is that which is being written. Right? Maktub. So this name, Yeshua, it also has the oo. It's called shurek in Hebrew. So this is a passive participle. The name of Jesus is passive. The root here is Yasha, which means to save. So how do you say this name as a passive participle, knowing that the root means to save? Did I go too fast? <laughs> the active would be Savior. The passive is the saved. The, sa the one saved. This is what his name means literally. The one who was saved. Why is he called that? Do you know what the Quran says? It says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا It says, they did not kill nor crucify Isa a.s. No, they did not kill nor crucify him. Uh, but it was made to appear so unto his enemies. For a surety they killed him not. His name literally means the one saved by God. That's what his name literally means. Very, very interesting. You know, there's a, a book in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is called Tanakh in Hebrew. It's called the Psalms. And some Muslim ulama, they say this is the Zabur. Wallahu alam. But there's an interesting verse in the Psalms. It's chapter 20, verse 6 of the Psalms. Psalms 26. Right? This is what it says. And this is what it sounds like in Hebrew. It says, Ata yada'atiki hushia adonai meshiko, yannahu meshemi kutsho bighvoroth yasha' yamino. It says, David writes, Allahu alam. It says, uh, I know that God will save his Messiah. God will save his Messiah. He shall hear him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Right? So this idea that Isa a.s. that the Messiah wasn't crucified, this is not a Muslim invention. This has precedent in prophecy in the Old Testament. Right? This idea that Jesus wasn't crucified was not invented by the Quran. It also has historical precedent. You guys hear of the Nag Hammadi library? It was a discovery of a library in 1947. It's called Nag Hammadi. It's in Egypt. You have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? That was discovered in 1947. That was two years after Nag Hammadi. So Nag Hammadi, 1945. Dead Sea Scrolls, 1947. What's interesting about the Dead Sea Scrolls is they were found in 1947, and full disclosure of the scrolls was not given until 1991. The only two organizations that had permission to look at the scrolls were the State of Israel, and the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican. No independent scholars for 40 years. And we know the Vatican has, the Vatican vault has 52 miles of shell space. It's 
to. Although I don't what they have down in the vault. But what they've disclosed is very interesting. Very clear descriptions of the Prophet in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We can talk about that later if you'd like. But this is a different topic, the Prophet in the Hebrew Bible. I'll give you one example of this, and then we'll return to the Nag Hammadi Library. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says that الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الأمي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والإنجيل those who follow the messenger the unlettered prophet النبي الأمي right أمي has different meanings in Arabic أمي can mean unlettered in the sense that one cannot read nor write right or it can mean someone can read or write but chooses not to so unlettered or uneducated uh, illiterate is you know sort of a derogatory I would use the word unlettered, no formal education, right? This is one of the meanings. Another meaning of ummi is motherly, because um means mother, right? Like Zayd ibn Haritha, who the Prophet sallallahu through Tabanni, which has been abrogated, he said, he went to the Kaaba and he said, Zayd ibn, Zayd ibn Muhammad, right? And that's been abrogated. Uh, but the father of Zayd ibn Haritha, named Haritha, came into Mecca with his uncle Kaab, and they saw Zayd, and they said, Zayd, come home, I'm your father. And Zayd said, talk to him, and he pointed to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, put your money away. Ask Zayd. If he wants to go with you, he can go. And his father said to Zayd, come, let's go home. And Zayd said, I'm not going to leave this man. He is my father and my mother. He said about the Prophet ﷺ. And his father said, you choose slavery over freedom. You choose this man over your own father. And he said, I've seen things from this man that I can't even explain. He is my father and my mother. Because the Prophet Wasallam, not only did he have those Jalali domestic qualities, but he had those Jamali beautiful qualities that are predominantly found in women. He was very merciful, forbearing. He would weep. He did not raise his voice, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha describes him. He would not raise his voice in the marketplace. He wouldn't speak all that much. Very taciturn in speech. There's some people just bah, 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 like me. Bah, 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 bah. The Prophet ﷺ would barely speak, right? But when he spoke, he spoke the truth, and he always spoke the truth. Like Amr ibn uh, Amr ibn uh, Abdullah ibn Amr al As, who was writing some of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, "Ya Rasulullah, when you're angry, shall I write it down?" He said, "Wal ladi ba'athani bil haq la yukhruju minhu illa al haq." Says the one by the one who sent me in truth, nothing comes out of this except the truth, and he pointed to his mouth. Everything the Prophet ﷺ said is a form of inspiration. So if you know a little bit Arabic, if it's it could mean that when he's reciting the Quran, he's not speaking from his caprice. But with the meme alif, ma, strong negation, means he never speaks from his caprice. Whatever he says is wahyun, is, is, is inspiration. Um, I forgot my train of thought. Where's it going with this? Huh? Aha. Yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I want to give you one example of, of uh, how the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in the Bible. Okay? So that's what the Quran says. Maktuban indahum fi Torati wal Injil. Oh, another meaning of ummi is Gentile. What is a Gentile? A non-Jew. In, in Hebrew, you call them the goyim, right? How do you say Gentile in Arabic? Ummi, right? Laysa alayna fil ummiyin as the Quran says, right? So Nabi al-Ummi could mean the Gentile prophet, very interestingly. Um, and it says that they'll find him mentioned in the Torah and in the Gospel. Now, we know the story, for example, of the Laylatul Qadr, right? The Prophet Sallallahu when he was 40 years old, he was in Ghar Hira, uh, in a mountain called uh, Jabal An nur And Jibreel Alayhi Salam, he comes into the cave in the form of a man, and he says to him, Iqra, and the Prophet says, Ma'ana biqari, right? So Isaiah 29, 12 says, the book is given to one who does not know letters. And it is said to him, Qira, and he shall answer, Lo yada'ati sayfar. It, we should, it, was, it shall be said to him, Qira and Qira in Hebrew and Iqra in Arabic are exact cognates. This is Isaiah 29, 12. And he shall answer, I knoweth no letters. Ma'ana biqari. Lo yada'ati sayfar in Hebrew. It's a perfect prophecy of the Prophet 
Uh, anyway, now, 1945, two years earlier, um, the Nag Hammadi Library was discovered, and they found Gospels that clearly, explicitly denied that Isa was crucified. Clearly denied it. Right? So before 1945, if a Muslim and a Christian would engage in a discourse, the Muslim would say, why don't you believe that Jesus was crucified? And the Muslim would say, well, it says in the Quran, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ And then the Christian would say, well, who cares what the Quran says? Matthew, Mark, and Luke that were written in the first century, all of them say he was crucified. Why do you give precedence over something written 500 years later in a foreign language? And the Muslim goes, well, I believe in the Quran. I believe in the revelation of God. And I believe that the Prophet ﷺ is a sadiq al amin Right? But that's his only argument, basically. But now we know there are other Gospels that explicitly denied the crucifixion, right? There's a book that they found at Nag Hammadi. It's called the, the, the Second Treatise of the Great Seth. That's what they called it. The Second Treatise of the Great Seth, which states very clearly that a man named Simon was crucified instead of Jesus. Very clearly. And uh, there was a large group of Christians in the first century called the Basilidians. The Basilidians who denied that Isa a.s was crucified. Okay. Who is Simon? So if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the New Testament, it says that when they were going to crucify Jesus, the Romans pulled a man out of the crowd named Simon, and they compelled him to bear the cross. Many Christians in the first century believed this man was crucified instead of Jesus. So in the Gospel of John, the last of the four Gospels in the New Testament, which is written around 100 of the Common Era, John says very clearly, Jesus bore his own cross he doesn't even mention that episode of Simon because he knows at his time there were Christians who categorically denied that Isa a.s. was crucified. A crucified Messiah is an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is? So they say four-sided triangle. Can you draw a four-sided triangle? You know, like the atheist will say, if God is all-powerful, can he create a stone that's so big he can't even carry it? And the Muslim goes, oh, no. I don't know how to answer, because the very question is faulty. You know who Stephen Hawking is? Very smart man, right, in many areas, at least in science. Stephen Hawking came into this masjid, and I said, do you think you're a smart man? He said, he said yes, probably, I don't know. I said, okay, Stephen, I want you to draw a four-sided triangle. He said, well, I can't do that. Ah, you're not the smartest man in the world. You can't do something simple as drawing a four-sided triangle. So this question, can Allah do something? Can he, can he make a boulder so big that he can't carry it? This question is faulty. It's saying, can Allah be so strong that he's weak? Can Allah be so strong that he's weak? That doesn't make any sense. It's like I ask you, for example, um, uh, in which jungle does the great white shark swim? Can you answer this question? No, the question is faulty. There's no answer that's, oh, you don't know something. The question is faulty, right? It's against the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have any type of weakness. This is why we reject Christian theology. Christian theology to us is mustahil, it is inconceivable. Because God cannot become a man, right? Because men are limited by nature. I'm limited right now. I have a 5 foot 11 inch frame, but in shoes I'm 6 feet tall. So 6 feet in, te in heels, right? But I'm limited. I can't touch those books over there, right? Unless I have the force. This is the Imperial Empire, in Inland Empire. <laughs> Maybe if I use the force, I might be able to touch it, right? But I can't. I'm limited. I can't fly around this room unless be idhnillah, unless Allah gives me the ability to do that, and He wants to break the hukum adi, right? Natural law, and He can certainly do that because He has qudra mutlaq, He is omnipotence, right? But if I if I don't eat for a few days, I'm dead. If I don't drink water for a few days, I'm dead. If I go outside over here and walk around with no clothes on for after a few days, I'll be in jail or dead, right? Uh, if the earth would just tilt eh, a little bit, we're all dead. If the moon would go back a little bit, we're dead. If the sun would go come up a little bit, we're all dead. We're dependent on so many things. If there's no gravity, we're dead, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is samad. Allah 
What is summit? This is called the hapax legomenon. It's one of the fancy words of the, um, uh, the, the scholars like to use to confuse the masses. Hapax legomenon. What that means is this is the only occurrence of the word in the entire Quran. Allahu samad in Surah Al-Ikhlas. And Ikhlas has different names. One of the names of Ikhlas is At-Tawheed or Al-Asas. There's a hadith that says, Ussisat as-samawatu sab'u wal-ardun as-sab'u ala qul huwa Allahu ahad. There's weakness in the hadith, but many of the ulama, they quote it. It says that the seven heavens and the seven earths are sustained by qul huwa Allahu ahad. Which means what? According to the ulama, as long as there's one person on earth saying that God is ahad, the heavens and the earth remain intact. The heavens and the earth remain intact. Very interesting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does samad mean? Samad means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la yahtaju ila shay wa kullu shay yahtaju ilayhi. So he is not in need of anything, but everything needs him. This is the meaning of samad. Right? So I can't be Allah. You can't be Allah because we need things. We're in need. Right? We are al fuqara We are poverty stricken. And Allah is ghani. Allah is independent. He is the wealthy and the rich. Right? So even someone who claims to be God, just by making the claim is disqualified. Because, you know, we have in our theology what, what are known as sifatul ma'ani, or qualitative attributes of God. In other words, these are qualities that God must have in order to be qualified or described as God. One of them is he must be omniscient. He must know everything. So, for example, if I say I'm God, immediately I'm disqualified because you know I'm a human being and I'm limited. But if you want to press the issue further and you say, okay, you're God, I say, yes. You say, okay, what did you have for lunch 48 days ago? I don't remember. Aha, you can't be God. What is 1,002 minus 566 times 245? I don't know. I need my calculator. Ah, okay, you're not God. Why? Because I have a weakness in knowledge, right? There's a passage in the Gospel of Matthew 24, 36, where Isa alayhi salam comes to, uh, where Isa alayhi salam says, of that day, the day of judgment, nobody knows. Not the angels, not even the son, referring to himself. And this doesn't mean son in the literal sense, right? This means a servant of God. This, was, this idea was corrupted by Trinitarian Christians. But only the Father. He doesn't know the Yom Al-Qiyamah. He admits it in the Gospel of Matthew 24, 36. And later versions of Matthew, they remove that little statement because they found it quite disturbing that Jesus doesn't know something. Because if Jesus doesn't know something, he's automatically disqualified as being God. You cannot qualify him as God anymore. You ever heard of C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis was a Christian philosopher. Um, Oxford or Cambridge, Martin Lings was one of his colleagues or students, and J.R.R. Tolkien also, who wrote the, um, what is it, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, I don't know, something like that. I haven't seen those movies, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so C.S. Lewis says, and this is, in, in Aristotelian logic, this is called the principle of the excluded middle. He's given you multiple choice, and he says, you have to choose one of these. Jesus was either a liar, or he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Right? Why is he saying this? Because for C.S. Lewis, very clearly, Jesus claims divinity in the New Testament. He claims to be God. You can only use this type of argument if your premise has been demonstrated that Jesus does, in fact, claim to be God. But nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, nowhere does Isa alayhi salam claim that he is God. Nowhere does he say, I am God. Nowhere does he say, worship me. Nowhere. Right? So he says, Jesus claimed to be God. So he's either lying or he's crazy. Right? There's only a crazy man. Because you go to UC Berkeley. I'm from the Berkeley area. There are two Jesuses on campus. There's one on the south end and one on the north end. Look like Jesus and everything. One of them has a, a, a sign around his neck. It says Yeshua in Aramaic. And he's holding a cane. He's got the beard. And he says, I am Jesus. And I said, you're Jesus? There's a guy over there saying he's Jesus. And he goes, he's a liar. I am the Christ. Okay. Um, so, or he says, or he's a Lord. Right? What we're saying is, Isa alayhi salam, 
would never claim to be God, ever. Because that would immediately disqualify him as being a prophet. And this is what the Jews believe also. This is by and large why Jews did not believe in Isa alayhi salam after the first generation. Because they cannot possibly accept the Christian message that a man is God. They can't accept that. That goes against the very fabric of their theology. Right? So he said God is a wahid and ahad. We mentioned this briefly in the khutbah. What does wahid mean? If I say, ana rajulun wahid, I am one man, right? Does that mean that you're not one man? No. Anta rajulun wahid. Anta rajulun wahid. You are one man. You are one man. So if I use the word wahid, this means one numerically. But there could be ithnan and thalatha and arba and khamsa, right? In other words, when I say ana rajulun wahid, I'm not uh, limiting the genus, the species of man to myself. There are other men. So Allah is wahid, meaning he's one entity, one person, not three persons, as the Trinitarians believe. He's one person. But Allah is also ahad. If I say, ana rajulun ahadun, what does this mean? This means I've limited the genus of rajul to myself. There's no other man in existence. There was, I think there was a movie, or a, the last man on earth or something. And I heard about it. I haven't seen it though. So that man can say, Anna rajulun ahad. Right? There's no other man in existence. But somebody could say, oh, but there's women. And women are comparable to men. Right? They're similar to men. There are things that women excel at that men do not. Women are better uh, at multitasking and they're better in linguistics. This is politically incorrect science, by the way. Right? Like men have better hand-eye coordination, but women have better linguistic skill. This is you know, done by Harvard University. Right? But, so they're, they're comparable. They excel at things and men are sometimes better and women are sometimes better. Right? And even if there were no women, somebody could make the argument, but chimpanzees are similar to man. 98% of the DNA is similar. Right? But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ There's nothing even remotely close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's one of a kind. He's one person and one of a kind. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ there's nothing like the likes of God. There's nothing like Laysa Ka Mithlihi Shayun. There's nothing even close to the closeness of God. There's, there's emphasis here. Right? So it's interesting. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Hosea, it says very clearly, chapter eleven, verse nine, it says in Hebrew, Ki Anuchi El Velo Ish. Indeed, I am God and not a man. These are mutually exclusive. God and man are mutually exclusive. Right? In other words, anyone who claims to be God, who is a man, cannot possibly be God. Right? So, <clears throat> Islam, yani, it accepts Isa alayhi salam as al-Masih, but it corrects the Christology. It corrects belief about him. We believe as Muslims that Isa alayhi salam is the Messiah. He is the, the anointed one of Bani Israel. What's interesting also is that if you read the Quran, there's a subtlety in the Quran, right? And this is, you know, this is open to challenge, but this is something interesting the ulama mentioned. Is they say that Isa alayhi salam, like Imam Suyuti makes this argument, Rahimahullah ta'ala. He says, who is the greatest companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam? Most people would say Abu Bakr Siddiq. He's the greatest companion of the Prophet He says, think about this. What about Isa alayhi salam? Isn't he a companion? Because what is a, what is a Sahabi? What is a Sahabi? How do you define a companion of the Prophet? Yes. This, so somebody that the Prophet saw while he, this person believed in his message because some of the Sahaba were blind. Abdullah ibn Maktoum never saw the Prophet وسلم, at least not with the basar, not with his physical eye. Right? The Prophet saw while that person believed in the Prophet وسلم, and as far as we know, this person died upon Islam. Right? That's, that's a Sahabi. So, uh, you know, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Sayyidina Umar, uh, Uthman Ali, these are Sahaba. Right? But someone like the Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, who converted to Islam, right? The Prophet ﷺ never laid eyes on him, although they're contemporaries. They lived at the same time. 
But since the Prophet ﷺ never saw him, he's considered a tabi'i. Right? He's a follower, he's not a sahabi. Wallahu alam. This is what the ulama debate. Right? So they say Isa alayhi salam, was he seen by the Prophet ﷺ while Isa alayhi salam was alive? We know Isa alayhi salam was never killed. Right? He wasn't killed. And the Prophet ﷺ saw him on Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. Right? And we know that Isa alayhi salam will die upon the faith. He's a prophet. He's going to come again in the second coming, not in the capacity of a prophet but in the capacity of a leader, a military leader, right? So he's a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Interestingly enough also, according to uh, Jewish Sharia, right, the nasab or the tribal distinction of the child is taken from the mother's side. It's matrilineal. Whatever your mother is, that's what you are. This is true in 11 of the 12 tribes, except for the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi is the tribe of Maryam alayhi salam. Ya ukhda Harun. Harun alayhi salam is from Levi. Musa and Harun are Levites. Right? That means that in order for her son to be from Bani Israel, her uh, husband has to be from Bani Israel. Right? But she doesn't have a husband. Isa alayhi salam, his birth, we believe in the mu'ajizah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala performed, that Isa alayhi salam was created in the womb of Maryam alayhi salam with any, without any male intervention. Right? That's why in the Quran, Isa alayhi salam is never quoted as saying, Ya qawmi, O my people. Very interesting, the subtlety in the Quran. Every other prophet says, Ya qawmi, because in order to say that, in order to call a people qawm, your father has to come from that people. But Isa alayhi salam doesn't have a father. So what does he say? Ya Bani Israel. So he's not even from Bani Israel. Wa rasulan ila Bani Israel. He was sent to Bani Israel. He's actually in our ummah. He's a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that was sent before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is why we believe in the second coming. He's going to come again. This is mentioned in many, many hadith. It's indicated in the Quran. That he's going to come back, he's going to have a family, going to make hajj. He's going to be buried next to the Prophet ﷺ. There's hadith that indicate that. Right? So this is something revelatory that we should, we should tell our Christian friends and neighbors. We believe in the second coming of Jesus. Peace be upon him. He's going to defeat the Antichrist. You know, the Prophet ﷺ. We don't want to talk too much about the Antichrist. It makes people nervous. By the way, if somebody comes into the masjid and starts talking about the Mahdi and, and things like that, be careful because a lot of these people are shayateen in human form that are trying to get you to say something. Right. Anyway, the Prophet وسلم, he said, uh, he said, I'm going to tell you something about the, the Dajjal, the Antichrist, that no other Prophet told their people. He said, Innahu a'war, rabbukum laysa bi a'war. He's one eyed, and your Lord is not one eyed. And then he said, on his forehead is written, kafara or kafir. And everyone will be able to read it, whether they're literate or not. Right? You know what's trending nowadays? What's trending? It began in the military, but now I've seen it just average people. They get kafir tattooed on their body. Kafir in Arabic. I've seen it like on the arm, it, you know, on the bumper sticker. I saw one on the neck. It's moving up, you know, it's going to... This is very common. Kafir. Right? They're going to start making hats probably. See, kafara, and you put it right here. Kafir. Allahu alam. Very interesting. Anyway, that's enough about the Antichrist. <laughs> but what is his message is, the message of the Antichrist is the opposite of the message of Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam, if you look at the hadith of Isa alayhi salam, there's a lot of hadith of him in our tradition. Some of it correlates to things in the New Testament, some of it doesn't. There's a hadith of Ahmad in which the Prophet Sallallahu he said that the Hawariyun, the disciples of Isa Alayhi the disciples of Jesus came to him one day and they said, how is it that you can walk on water? And Jesus said, Bil Yaqeen, with certitude. And they said, we don't understand. And he said, bring to me three objects. They said, what? He said, bring gold, bring stones and bring mud. Bring those three objects to me. And they brought it to him. 
right? And he said, what do you say about these objects? And the disciple said, well, you know, gold is better than stones and stones are better than mud. He says, they're all the same to me. They're all the same to me. If you can understand the mystery of that, then you can walk on water. So the hadith of Isa alayhi salam, they deal with maut and akhirah and zuhud. Death, afterlife, and asceticism. That's, that's the message of Isa alayhi salam as delivered to us. Right? So why is he like this? Why is he teaching these things? Like he says, the similitude of, of the hubbud dunya, the love of mammon, the love of the world, is like a man who's out at sea on his boat. He's lost. He starts taking a handful of seawater into his mouth. The more he drinks, the thirstier he gets, and then he dies from it. The sea represents the dunya, the world. You'll never be satiated, and it's going to kill you. Get away from the dunya. This is his message. Because the religious establishment of his day, they were called the, the Sadducees. Right? They were the high priests of the temple. They didn't even believe in an akhirah. They didn't believe in an afterlife. Did you know most Jews today don't believe in an afterlife? The majority of Jews today don't believe in an afterlife. Back then, the temple authority did not believe in an afterlife. They were called the Sadducees. Are you ready for a bad joke? When they're resurrected on the day of judgment, they're going to be sad, do you see? Sorry. Anyway. So, so their message was one of complete materialism. This is the only life there is. That's the message of the Dajjal also. Salvation is through the dunya. Salvation is through the dunya. That's why people, you know, it's really interesting. People have these these competitions on Facebook. Who has the most followers? I want followers. I mean, think about what that sounds like. Right? I want followers. One of my teachers said that the seeds of the claim of the Pharaoh lie dormant in the heart of every man. An Rabbukumul A'la. I am your Lord most high. The seeds of that claim lie dormant in the heart of every man. And how do you water those seeds? Hubbu shuhra wa hubbu riyasa. Love of fame and love of leadership. This is how you water those seeds. Right? It's like Justin Bieber, you know. He's all, all right, 10,000 believers. The people who follow him on Twitter, he calls them believers. Right? From the word believer. I mean, people worship. I mean, that, he, he has this God complex. He can do whatever he wants. He's above the law, right? And this is who people are imitating nowadays. I'm going to take a selfie of myself. Selfie means nafsi. You translate selfie into Arabic, a nafsi. This is my nafsi. I have 500 followers. MashaAllah. I hope that works out for you. You know. Um, anyway, so we look at the hadith of Isa alayhi salam. He's dealing with a people that are steeped in materialism. So you can imagine like if you have a piece of paper and you fold it and you crease it, how do you get that paper to stand up straight again? You can't just pick it up and hope it'll stay because it's going to repel, right? You have to crease it the other way and it's going to find an equilibrium. So the Jews at the time of Isa salam, were steeped in materialism. So he brings pure spirituality, but he does not negate the Sharia. This is where our Christian friends and neighbors with all due respect, you know, Pauline Christianity, Hellenistic Christianity, they made a major error that they think that Isa a.s. abrogated the Sharia. There's no more Sharia. Right? This is the message of Paul uh, and his adherents. Whereas Isa a.s. he followed the Sharia. So we have Sharia and Haqiqa. We have um, we have the law which we follow. We also have spirituality, and these two things are not in conflict. Many Muslims again they buy into uh, kind of this, you know, this Protestant sort of uh, idea that the law and the spirit are somehow in, in tension to one another. We don't believe that as Muslims. We never believe that. You know, Rumi is the most popular selling poet in America. And the way, and some people think Rumi was like this guy who twirled around and never prayed and, you know, a goofy Sufi. And he was a Qadi. He was a judge in Konya. I mean, this was a man of Sharia, right? A man who never missed prayer. Miss a prayer, unheard of, right? But people don't see that because the Protestant kind of mindset that we've sort of bought into is that the Sharia and spirituality are in tension to one another, that there's a, they've, they've been bifurcated. But that's not how we look at, that's not our conception of religion. That the Sharia is a means by which to attain spirituality, right? Um, so that, that 
is has to be important. You know, it's um, America imports a lot of things overseas. You know, there's different types of imperialism. There's obviously going into a country with your tanks and bombs and so on and so forth. But Edward Said talks about imperialism that is done on the level of linguistics also, and that's actually more harmful when people construct your own religion for you, right? Define your terminology, right? So he said, this is what jihad means, unmitigated perpetual warfare against unbelievers. So when the youth hear something like that, and then they read the Quran, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Oh, I can't be Muslim. I don't believe that. I can't. Because they bought into this idea, of this definition of Daniel Pipes, that jihad means you have to kill everybody, right? So you have to be very, very careful who defines our religion. Sometimes we take from other people. We don't even know what we're doing. Right? So if you look at, you know, American, American Protestantism is very different than what we have, you know, Christianity in the Middle East. If you go to a church in the Levant, right, like in Syria, in villages, uh, Lebanon, you'll go to a church, you'll walk into the church and it looks like a masjid. It looks similar to this, people sitting on the ground, the women behind the men, the women are covered. There's people are standing and they're prostrating. They're reciting in Aramaic, right? If you put one of those Christians in the Staples Center at a Joel Austin revival, you would have no idea what's going on. What's going on here? There's a concert. Why? Because the Sanad, this, this is the secret of our religion as Muslims. The secret of this religion is Sanad, transmission. Our knowledge is taken, talaqi, it's taken from someone who took from someone, who took from someone, who took from someone, who took from someone, who took from a tabi'i, who took from a sahabi, who took from the Prophet who took from Jibreel alayhi salam, who took from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who doesn't take knowledge. Right? This is, called, this is called sanad. So the sanad in some of these places in the Middle East, the Christianity there is stronger than the Christianity in America. Right? So we can see more of the true Isa alayhi salam in some of those places. The reality of Isa alayhi salam is in our ummah. That Isa alayhi salam was a Muslim. You know, if Isa alayhi salam walked into the masjid and I asked him, Oh Isa alayhi salam, are you a Christian? He wouldn't even know what I was talking about because he never heard this word in his life, his entire life. This is admitted, right? What a Christian, what does that mean? I don't want to offend anybody, but this is a fact, right? The book of Acts tells us they were first called Christians in Antioch after the ascension of Isa alayhi salam. And even that's anachronistic, but we want to get into details. Anyway, I would expect Isa alayhi salam to say, my religion is a religion of submission unto God. Right? Submission unto God. And that's what he says in the New Testament. Whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, and my sister. And Isa alayhi salam, he believed in Allah. I was flipping the channels years ago, and there was this man named Pat Robertson. You've probably heard of him. He ran for president in 1984. Thank God he didn't win. Anyway, I mean, not, it's not like we got somebody much better. But anyway, um, so Ro Robertson, he, he was, and I've, I've flipped through the channels, and I've seen this show three or four times, and every single time he's talking about Islam, which leads me to believe he's always talking about Islam in every show. One of the things he says was, he said, you know, the Muslims, they believe in Allah. And then the lady next to him, who was a former beauty queen or whatever, turned born-again Christian, she said, uh, who's Allah? And then he said, the moon god. He's the moon god. I said, well, moon god? How do you know that? And he said, well, you ever seen the flag of Pakistan? There's a moon. And they're like, okay, you know. They also follow a lunar calendar. You know, the Jews also follow a lunar calendar, right? But no one's going to say that they worship the moon god. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew 5 and 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And again, children of God here is meant metaphorically. This is majaz, right? That ibadu muqramun, it means servants raised to honor. Later on, it was literalized, it was made literal that Jesus is the Son of God, begotten, not made by the Nicene Council, and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, if you translate that into Aramaic, which Christians did in the 4th century, this is what it sounds like. Allah, Jesus uses the word Allah for God. How do you say God in Syriac? Allah. Right? That's the word he used himself. 
Isa alayhi salam. Right? Um, so this is, yani, Isa alayhi salam, when he comes back and he may come into this masjid, it's conceivable. We believe in the second coming. Right? You know, he's, he's going to be able to follow exactly what we're doing as Muslims. His language was similar, the way he prayed was similar, his beliefs are similar, everything is similar. Right? It's like the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. The Christians have this prayer called the Lord's Prayer, right? That actually rhymes in Aramaic. There's a rhyme to it, right? That you lose in translation, right? And one time I recited this in a church so the Christians can hear, you know, Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be thy name, you know, is oh, 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 the ending. That's called saja in Arabic. And I said, listen to the Quran now. It's called Saja. Does it sound similar? Right? So it's very interesting. You know, we have to, you know, the Prophet وسلم, he said, you know, spread uh, or convey from me even one verse or statement. So it's our responsibility as Muslims to be a good example, to give da'wah. And da'wah means an invitation to a banquet. And da'wah does not mean to stand up on a stage and give a speech. If you're an alim, that's what you do, right? Because oftentimes Muslims do a lot more damage when they speak, myself included, right? For, for us, da'wah, for the laity, the best thing we can do is just be a practicing Muslim because the sunnah of the Prophet is beautiful inherently. Even if it's just smiling at people, opening a door, giving up your seat. You know, one time I was on the subway system in the Bay Area, it's called the BART train. And this, this woman came into the BART train and I got up and I offered my seat to her. I didn't know she was a feminist. So I don't need your seat. What do you think I am? You know, I was like, whoa, sorry. So you have to be careful, there's, there's feminists out there. Uh, but you should, you, should be, uh, you should be kind, you know? And feminism today, is, it just means, to, uh, it, it, for people it means to imitate men. How can you be a feminist? Just imitate what men are doing. That's not feminism, right? You're just copying what men want to do. You know, like they used to have in the 1980s, these shoulder pads and the business suits because women want to look bigger, more imposing like a man, right? Very, very strange. Um, we have to embrace how God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he made us. Like he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. he said, there's three things from your dunya that I love. A good smell, the prayer, which is the coolness of my eye, and women. And that does not mean what the Orientalists say it means, that he's, you know, you know, it's some sort of uh, lustful addiction or something that he has. What he meant there, according to the ulama, is that he loves the feminine qualities of forbearance and mercy that he himself had, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Like, remember, we, we all know the story of the Bedouin who came into the masjid and urinated. We've heard this a million times, right? Do you know what happened after that? In one version, in Ahmad, uh, Musnad Ahmad, they went outside, and this Bedouin, he turned around, all the men were leaving the masjid. And he said, Allahumma irhamni wa muhammadan wa la tarham ma'ana ahadan. He said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and on Muhammad and nobody else. Why? Because the Sahaba tried to attack him when he was urinating, in mid-urination, which is quite scary. So the Prophet said, he said, leave, leave him, leave him. And they said, okay, we'll wait till he's done, and then it's over for him. And he said, no, 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 no. So the Prophet went with rifq, with gentleness. He said, no, he said, ya akhil Arab, and, oh, my Arab brother. You know, these are masajid. We don't do these things here. This is, you know, we salawat and qiraat and adhkar. This, these are the things we do in the masjid. And he didn't know. A lot of people don't know. They just don't know. Sometimes we get questions from non-Muslims that seem to be offensive. I got a question one time in a Unitarian Universalist church. And I'm thinking, okay, they're, they're Unitarian, that's good. But it was very difficult. Because people hear a lot of things. This guy raised his hand. Why do you abuse your wife? Like, Me? Right? So, and... Before you can ask why, you have, to ask, you, know, you have to know what. In logic, in formal logic, they teach you. In or, before you can say why, you have to know what, right? So I said, how do you know I abuse my wife? And he says, well, do you let your wife drive a car? And I say, uh, I, I actually order my wife to drive a car. <laughs> then people don't know. You know, we have to be, this other gentleman, he raised his hand and he said, 
Uh, I'll never forget this one. He said, I have a question for you. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want to go to Turkey in the summer. I said, oh, beautiful. But I have a concern. I said, what is your concern? I'm afraid that a group of Wahhabis are going to kidnap me and torture me. And I said, wait, wait, wait. Isn't that taken too? <laughs> I, said, I, I said, have you seen that movie? He said, yeah. No, you'll be fine. And don't worry about it. Now, people just don't know, right? So he said, have mercy on me and on Muhammad and nobody else. For dhahik al-Nabi. The Prophet laughed. He thought that was funny that he made that dua leaving the masjid. And the Prophet said, no, don't restrict the mercy of God. The mercy of God is vast. It's vast. Right? You know how we hear all the time, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with sort of uh, pietistic sort of representations of Christianity and film and, 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 you know, and on TV, but usually if they make a Jesus movie, they'll have the scene where Jesus is crucified and then he says, Father, forgive them. Right? In Greek, um, he says, pater afes autois. Did you know that verse is a fabrication to the New Testament? By consensus of New Testament scholars. That verse was added later to the New Testament. In other words, Jesus, of course, Jesus was never crucified. Right? But from a standpoint of the New Testament, he never made that statement. Right? But we all know about it. But how many people know that the Prophet wasallam on the day of Ghazwat Urhud, with blood streaming down his face, was trying to catch his blood in his hands. He was like this. And absorbing the blood with his sleeves. Why? He told the Sahaba, if one drop of this blood should strike the earth, then immediately our enemies are going to be obliterated. His enemies that they're fighting against him, that have bloodied his face, that are killing his companions, that are cannibalizing his companions on the battlefield. If one drop should spill, on the earth, immediately the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would descend on our enemies. And the Sahaba said, great, let it flow. Right? And then they saw him a short time later and he had his hands raised and he was, he was supplicating. And the Sahaba said, it's over. This is going to be, we're, they're done. And, and they heard, Allahumma di qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. This is what he said. Oh Allah, guide my people. For they don't know. Right? This is what he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No one's heard of this. But Isa Alayhi Salam, forgive them. They've all heard of it, but he didn't actually say that. <laughs> Very strange. Why? Because our religion again is being defined for us. We have to we have to define our own religion. Right? And we can't be the sort of passive stance where who am I to do things? No, do things to your own capacity. Support organizations that can do that, right? This is very, very important because if we don't define ourselves, other, people's, other people are going to define us. Whoever defines the terminology controls discourse, and discourse is everything. And right now the discourse is the good Muslims are Muslims who do not believe that the Quran is a word of God, as articulated by the RAND report that was put out by the RAND Corporation, you know, Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and Condoleezza Rice. The good Muslims are those who believe that the Prophet ﷺ is just a historical figure and that his life has little to no bearing on our life today. There's no transcendent universal aspect. And the Quran is history and poetry. Those are the good Muslims. The bad Muslims, they say, are not the terrorists. They're bad. But he said, even worse than the terrorists, this is what they say, even worse than the terrorists are traditionalists who say that the Prophet ﷺ is a messenger of God and that his example is alive today and is dynamic. The Qur'an is the word of God and it's universal revelation. These are the bad Muslims. These are the, the biggest threat to our, what do they call it? Our strategies in the world, whatever that means. Right? So we got to think about this. Very clearly in the Qur'an. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا you have the Messenger of God, a beautiful example. Verily, you dominate praiseworthy character. Right? Say, if you love Allah, you have to follow me. You have to follow the Prophet. Then will Allah love you. So, 
we have to be careful, you know. And we can't be afraid. Nobody's doing anything wrong. No one's advocating violence, you know, we're good citizens. But we believe this to be a revelation of God. Everyone makes moral judgments, right? Right now in, in the academy, Western Academy, because I go to Western Academy, the, uh, the main issue that divides, the main issue that non-Muslims use in Western Academy to determine whether a Muslim is a progressive forward thinker or a backwards antiquated traditionalist is how you feel about homosexuality. This is the main issue. How do you feel? If you say, I believe it's a sin. Oh, you're, you're a crazy traditionalist. You, you're, you're, you're prejudiced and you're a hateful person. You know, it's mentioned, you know, it's mentioned, you know, it says in the New Testament, New Testament. And, you know, we're not, we're not saying, you know, that any, we're not saying we should hate people or anything like that. All of us are in a state of sin, all of us, right? But we start denying things that are dalil qat'i, that are mentioned in the Quran explicitly. This is kufr, is very dangerous. It says in the New Testament, Isa alayhi salam, it says in Matthew chapter 10, he told his disciples, he says, go into the lands, the towns of Israel, but don't go to the towns of the Samaritans. And then he says, when you go to a city and you evangelize them with the gospel, if they don't accept your city, leave the city and shake the dust of that city off of your feet. For verily, Sodom and Gomorrah will fare better on the day of judgment than that city. Do you understand? He sent his Hawariyun, the disciples, give them the gospel. If they have kufr, if they reject the gospel, shake the dust off your feet. Meaning that city is done. It's done. The Qawm al Sodom and Gomorrah, will have a better time on the day of judgment than that city. Right? <laughs> Very interesting. You know, the Prophet wasallam, when he went to Ta'if, he was stoned out of the city. He didn't send Sahaba, he went himself. He went alone, stoned out of the city. His feet were covered in his own blood. He lost consciousness under a tree, right? The angel descends, the angel of wrath, and says, give me the word. And these people are done, the Bani Thaqif of the Hawazin, the people of Ta'if. Give me the word and they're done. What did he say? Yeah, let me shake the dust of the city off my feet. No. Bal arju. Bal arju. An yakhruja min aslabihim. Man ya'budallaha wahda. Wa la yushriku bihi shay'a. I have hope in their descendants that people will come and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their only God. Today the city of Ta'if is completely Muslim. The city of Ta'if is the greatest exporter of roses today. Because the Prophet sallallahu did not give up on them. You know, some people sometimes... We have very short thresholds of da'wah. I was in a masjid one time with a group of brothers. The Christian brother was there. The Christian brother was asking very critical questions. That's okay. He can ask questions. No, no problem whatsoever. Right? As long as it's done with adab, you know. And he was asking questions. The uncle walks into the masjid. Uncle. We call him uh, Chacha Seb. What do we call him? Kaka Seb. <laughs> Amu. Walks into the masjid. He listens to the conversation for two minutes. Two minutes. And he says, in front of everybody, including the Christian brother, he says, you know, these kuffar. These kuffar, yani they, Allah has put a, a cover on their eyes, brothers. Their hearts are dead. They are fuel for the nar. He's going to burn khali dan fiha. Leave him alone. And the brother said, what is, what is he talking about? He's talking about me? Said, no, brother, this is a local majnoon. Don't worry about him. He comes in sometimes, you know, it's okay. Okay, thank you, sir. You know, two minutes was the threshold. You know, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb is fighting against the Prophet ﷺ for over 20 years, actively fighting against him, trying to kill him, and killing Ahlul Bayt, killing Sahaba, actively, and the Prophet ﷺ says to him one day after 20 years, don't you think it's about time for you to become Muslim? <laughs> and he said, you're still, you're, he says, SubhanAllah, you st you're still kind to me? You still talk to me after what I've done? He said, yeah, of course. Isn't it about time for you to become Muslim? You know when they're coming into Mecca, Fatha Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ, he gave the standard to Sa'd ibn Ubadah. And said Umar al was saying, Al-Yawma Yawmul, he said, uh, Al-Yawma Yawmul Malhama. 
uh, Quraysh. He was screaming this. Today is a day of slaughter. The debasement of the Quraysh. And he's saying this coming into the Haram and he passes Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who, who had just become Muslim. Today is a day of slaughter. The debasement of the Quraysh. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, was told this is what Sa'ad is saying. So he sent a rider to go to Sa'ad to take the standard from him. And Sa'ad said, I'm not going to give it to you. He said, no, I was sent by the Prophet. I don't believe you. And so the rider came back to the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, Sa'ad, he's not giving it up. I don't know what to do. The Prophet ﷺ, he takes off his blessed imama. He says, present this to Sa'ad. And say, give up the, the standard, the liwa. And then he said, but give it to his son Qais, who was next to him. Look at the hikmah of the Prophet ﷺ. He knows that Sa'ad will have his feelings hurt if you take the standard. But if you honor the son, you honor the father. If I shake your son's hand, I'm honoring you. So he goes to Sa'ad and he says, give up the standard. Here's the turban of the Prophet. Immediately he gives it up. And he said, here, give it to your son though. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, he, walks, he rides by Abu Sufyan, who is very obviously distraught by what he was hearing. And he says to him, Al-Yawma, Yawmul Marhama, Yu'izzullahu Qurayshan. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh. Right? This is the Prophet And he could have taken out the entire city. You know, it says in the Torah, in the Christian Bible, it says that when you go to a city and conquer it, if the, if the people of that city don't willingly become your slaves, kill the men and take the women and children as captives. However, if that city is in the lands that the Lord thy God gives thee as an inheritance, meaning Palestine, save nothing that breathes. Destroy everything. Man, women, child, animals. You know what happened to Jericho? This is, we don't read the Bible. Very interesting. Complete decimation. 31 city-states, men, women, and children, total genocide, right? The Prophet ﷺ, the people of Mecca, they know we've committed khiyana, we've warred against him. He could take us all out right now. They come to him, Akhun Karim, you are a noble brother. The Prophet ﷺ, he climbs Abu Qubais. He's going to make an announcement, and people think, oh, the Meccans, the Quraysh, the Mushrikeen, they are, oh, we're done. What does he say? At, there's no, there's no blemish on you today. There's nothing wrong with you. Allah has forgiven you. Exactly what Yusuf السلام, said to his brethren when Yusuf, when they came to Egypt. SubhanAllah, this is rahmatil alameen. And this is the message we have to tell people about the Prophet وسلم, That the message of the Prophet وسلم, is perfectly in agreement with the true gospel of Isa السلام, both of these are prophets. They're both brethren. There's a hadith of the Prophet where he says, the closest to me in disposition is Isa ibn Maryam. The closest to me in my character is Jesus, the son of Mary. And there's no prophet between us. Right? These, are, these are all brethren. We believe in all of the prophets. Right? And Islam restores the true theology of Isa alayhi salam, the true gospel. And I'll end with this and we'll, and we'll open for questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِينَ حَتَّى تَأْتِيَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ the, mush, the, the kafar, the unbelievers, from the people of the book, meaning people of the Bible, Jews and Christians, and the idolaters, are not going to break away from their unbelief until there comes to them al bayina clear evidence. What is clear evidence? The next verse, رَسُولٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ يَتْلُوا سُحُفًا مُتَهَرًا a messenger from God who recites to them purified scrolls. Fiha kutubun qayyima. In these scrolls are books that are made correct. Kutub. Very interesting. The Mufassirin say here, why does Allah say kutub? Why does He describe the Quran with the word books instead of kitab like He does in other places? Because the essence, the truth of the Torah and the Gospel and the Zabur are found in the Quran itself. The essence of that teaching. This is progressive revelation, right? So becoming a Muslim is becoming truly a follower of Isa alayhi salam. Right? Becoming a true follower of Isa alayhi salam. So we'll, we'll end it there, inshallah.
Um, I'm sorry if I said anything that offended anyone. It wasn't our intention. Um, I'm sorry I spoke so long. I know everyone's kind of tired. But if we can have, you can leave any time you want. We won't be offended. Uh, but if you want to ask some questions or make some comments or throw things at me, please feel free. I'll duck under the table. Yes, sir. Yeah, so many of these hadith have weakness in them. Many of these hadith. Um, so usually they come from uh, the tabi'in. They come from the tabi'in. So many of them don't actually go back to the Prophet ﷺ. So we approach them with caution. Some of them do go back to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, like in Bukhari and Ahmad. Uh, what's that? He said it himself. Some of them come from Sahaba, which could have hukum marfu'ah which means that they could have heard it from the Prophet ﷺ, but we don't know for certain. So we approach those hadith with caution. With, ca with caution. Many of them originate with the tabi'een. Right? Imam Ghazali will quote a lot in the Ihya ulum al -Din. He'll quote a lot from Isa salam, you know, acknowledging that many of the hadith have weakness in them. But Imam Ghazali is dealing with the same type of mentality that Isa salam dealt with, you know, this kind of emphasis on formalism, right? The emphasis on the, on the exoteric, aspect of the religion and not so much on the the inner aspect so he's dealing with symptoms that Isa alayhi salam was dealing with as well so for purposes of edification you can quote weak hadith a weak hadith does not mean it's forged it's not moldur you know imam suyuti has a book called al mawdu'at al kubra where he collects all of the forged hadith no ibn qayyim has a book right a, a hadith that is da'if means it passes but it's like a c minus if you get a C minus on a test, you're like, uh, but I passed, right? That's what, that's what a weak hadith is. So you don't use a weak hadith for aqidah, and you don't use it for sharia, but you can use it for nasiha. You can use it for advice edification. So that's what he's doing. Yes, sir. You, you have to get a report. It was put out a few years ago. It's called, um, uh, it's, it's um, called Fear Incorporated, the Center of American Progress. You can find that you can Google this. The organization that put it out is called the Center of American Progress, called Fear Incorporated. And I think the subtitle is Tracing the Roots of Islamophobia in America. And this is phenomenal work that was done by these uh, young people. Uh, many of whom are non-Muslim. The principal author is a brother named Wajahat Ali, who is actually related to me through marriage. Um, but in that report, they document seven individuals that received over $40 million from various conservative think tanks for the express purpose of rewriting Islam in America, changing Islam from, from within, as they say. And how do you do that? You define Muslim terminology for the Muslims. Right? So that they have no choice but to conform to their definitions. Right? Um, so this is, this is quite, you know, it's very, it's a big ambitious theological project that they're doing. It used to be like the Orientalists will just kind of outright slander the Prophet wasallam. So the Quran is from, the, from Satan and so on and so forth. And, and one of them said, this was the abbot of Cluny. They lie too, like outright. The abbot of Cluny was... I think his name was Peter, the so-called Venerable. He said the Prophet died in the year 666, which is the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation, which is a total lie. Not even close to 632, 631, something like that. But, you know, he's going, to, he's going to lie. So, But now it's hard to just lie like that. So what they do is they bring this guy on TV who has a PhD in Islamic history or something. He's got a, he's got a tie on, you know. So, oh, he's legit, right? And then he gives these statements that no Muslim on earth actually believes, right? So he's building a straw man. In philosophy, that's called building a straw man, right? 
So you say, for example, um, uh, if I go to a Christian and I say, and of course I would never say this, but this is an, an atheist would I might say this and say, um, Jesus used to kill children. And then the Christians say, whoa, what, what, what are you talking about? Jesus used to kill children. What do you mean? It says in the infancy gospel of Thomas that when Jesus was a schoolboy, he used to kill children for fun. And the Christian response would be, I don't believe that's a canonical book. That's not in the New Testament. That's spurious. That's apocryphal, right? So you can't use that in order to disprove Christianity because Christians don't believe in it. You see what I'm saying? So it's very important that the youth especially, and there's a faith crisis with the youth. Many of them, there's a lot of ridda, people leaving Islam, becoming Christian or leaving Islam. Uh, and it's because they don't have access to authentic, authoritative knowledge. You have to stay in, uh, in, in contact with the ulama of, even of your community. Now we have the internet. You can, you can take lessons from mashayikh around the world. There's really no excuse. If you have questions on aqidah, because many of the immigrants, like my parents that came to the country, there was an internet when they were small. Everyone was Muslim. They never heard Richard Dawkins give a lecture or they never you know, listened to Christopher Hitchens, right? So most of their questions back then were related to orthopraxis, like fiqhi issues. You know, that's their question. But nowadays, the youth today, their questions are not orthopraxis. They have questions of orthodoxy. In other words, how do you know there is Allah? How do you know this is the word of God? How do you know he's a messenger of God? And the immigrant community is just not equipped to answer these questions. So the youth, they go elsewhere. They go to the internet. They go to Sheikh Google and Imam Wikipedia. <laughs> they go there and they put in their question. The Prophet ﷺ had many wives. And they, oh, 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 okay. And then next thing you know, I've met many youth that have confided to me personally that they're not even Muslim, and they're in the masjid with their father, reading a mushaf, praying sunnah. He said, I'm going through motions because I don't want to disappoint my father. I'm not even Muslim anymore. That's what they say. Because they're addicted to these things on the internet. Um, so there's a difference between information and knowledge. What's on the internet is a lot of information. Knowledge, however, is different. Knowledge is information that has been verified through authoritative channels, right? And it's also something that's implemented. So it's, it's very important that we take our knowledge, our deen, from authoritative scholars. I mean, this is just 101, right? Uh, do you guys know who Elmo is from Sesame Street? Some of the, you know Elmo, right? Elmo. Elmo. Elmo means God, by the way. It's a theophoric name. Anyway, if Elmo goes on TV and says, you know, you shouldn't drink. I'm not going to do my Elmo impersonation in the masjid, but usually I do it. Anyway, it, he says, if he says, if you drink Diet Coke, it's going to give you osteoporosis. Are you going to believe Elmo? You might think, wait a minute, Elmo is a puppet. He's best friends with Cookie Monster, who's a junkie. <laughs> um, I'm not going to believe Elmo on this one, right? But what about Elmo who puts on a suit and tie and he says, you know, so we have a bunch of Elmos, Daniel Pipe, Steve Emerson's, David Yerushalami, Ayan Hirsi Ali, you know, these people, Steve Emerson, right? Who look legit, but it's really a bunch of Elmos up there because they don't have, they've never studied traditional sciences. They don't know Islam. They have a few sound bites that they use. But if Dr. Oz, you know who Dr. Oz is, right? Dr. Muhammad Oz. His first name is Muhammad, by the way. Mehmed, the, the, the Turkish, they use Mehmed. Um, if he says, don't drink Diet Coke, it gives you osteoporosis. You might go, oh, okay, Dr. Oz, he knows what he's talking about. What's the difference? Dr. Oz is a doctor. He studied. He has knowledge that is from transmission from a doctor. He studied under a doctor who studied under a doctor who studied under, I don't know, who's the first doctor? Right? So, that's, so the youth don't know how to navigate that. They'll read something on the internet by doctor so-and-so. The prophet was this and that. Oh, a doctor said it. Or they go to the university. They take a philosophy class at the university. And he's a PhD in philosophy. And he's an atheist. And he's saying all of these crazy things about Muslims and Islam. 
And this youth who's 18, 19, 20 years old, he's completely swayed by it. And then he goes home to his father. This is what I heard. And his father says, don't worry about that. Go pray. Go make wudu. That's not going to help me. Go make wudu. You know? So it's important that we have balance in our life. You know, um, you know, earn a living, raise a family, but also be in contact with the Muslim scholastic community and always be in a program of study once a week, twice a week, something like that. Learn something. Learn Quran. Learn Tajweed. Learn Arabic. Learn theology. Uh, learn fiqh. Whatever you want to learn. Learn one of these sacred sciences. It'll keep your iman fresh. And don't forget the dhikr. Jaddidu imanakum. The Prophet ﷺ said, renew your faith by saying, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha. Say this. One of my teachers said, you can say La ilaha illallah without opening your mouth. Ready? You don't know what my tongue's doing. You can say it. To people, I can't make, I can't take out my dhikr beads on the train and I can't go on. People are going, oh, this guy, he's insane, majnoon. You don't have to, you don't have to, do it internally. Make dhikr, right? Make dhikr, it has an effect on the heart. The name of Allah is weighty. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, on the day of judgment, there's a prophecy. On the day of judgment, a man will come whose bad deeds are going to be presented on scrolls, 99 scrolls, stretched out as far as the eye can see. And it's going to be placed on one side of the mizan, of a scale. And then a card, a bitaqa, this is called hadithul bitaqa, a card is put on the other side of the scale. But written on the card is, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. And the card will fall and the scrolls will rise. And Allah will say to the man, nothing, nothing is weightier than my name. Right? So we, we have to have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This doesn't mean that we become lax in our deen and we start saying things like, you know, bachim, qalbam pakas. I get this, I speak Farsi, you know. My qalb is pure. And you say, why don't you come pray with us? My heart, you don't know. I have me and Allah. Yani. No, brother, if prayer is fard. No, brother. I make dua. My prayer is in my heart. Right? Like his brother said one time, I'm fasting in my heart. <laughs> He's eating like this. Brother, brother you, it's Ramadan, brother. Brother Ramadan. I'm fasting in my heart. <laughs> you know. I said, well, brother, the Prophet wasallam, whose maqam and mahmud prayed six times a day. Salatul Wit, Salatul Tahajjud, a third of the night is wajib on him. He prays six times a day, but you've transcended prayer. There was a great scholar, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. He was walking down the road, and he would have you know, revelatory experiences, you know, mukashafat and things like that. And one time, he says, walking down the road, and suddenly the heavens opened, and he felt this warmth come over him, and a soothing voice said, "Ya Shaykh, you don't have to pray anymore." You're above the prayer. You've transcended the prayer. MashaAllah for you. You know what the Shaykh said? He said, Anta mal'oon. You are accursed. And then the vision went away. Iblis. Trying to mess around. Imam Abu Qasim al Junaid, one of the great articulators of Tasawwuf from Baghdad, he made dua. He wanted to, he wanted to speak to Iblis. So he said, Allah, please send me Iblis. I'm going to ask him a question. This is what's related from him. He's walking down the streets of Baghdad. He sees a man motioning to him like this. And Al-Junaid said, when he saw the man, he started shaking immediately. So he goes and he says, what do you want? And the man says, you're the one that, I'm the one that you've been wanting to ask. I'm shaitan. And then he composes himself and he says, why didn't you make sajda to Adam? What's wrong with you? Why didn't you make sajda? And shaitan says, Astaghfirullah, you want me to make sajda to a human being and not Allah? Are you kidding me? This is shirk. And Junaid said, I said, no, you're a liar. That's not what you said. You said, ana khayrun minhu. Right? So he was trying to play with him. That's what shaitan does. And this is not a sajda of ibadah. When the angels made sajda, this is for ta'zim. This is for respect. And this has been abrogated in our religion. We don't make sajda in any form 
to any human being or creation, only to Allah. So there's no more sajda. Like when Yusuf alayhi salam, ra'aytu ahad ashran kawkaban wa shams wal qamara, ra'aytu um li sajideen. Right? I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon make sajda to me. Sajda here again is for ta'zim, it's for respect. Because Yaqub alayhi salam, when he heard that, he didn't say, Astaghfirullah, who do you think you are, God? No, he said, don't tell your brothers, they're going to try to do something. Because he understood the context of that. But this is what shaitan does. He's going to play with the mind a little bit. You know? And we have protections. We, ha we have to be in wudu. Wudu is a protection. We recite ayatul kursi. We recite al muawwadatain the two last surahs of the Quran. Recite surah al-ikhlas. Say, la ilaha illallah. Right? Go to Salat al Juma. Right? Have these sorts of uh, the, the, the prophetic invocations. Learn the ad'iyah of the Prophet. The Prophet used to have a dua for every occasion. When he goes into the bathroom, when he walks out of the bathroom, when he walks into the house, when he starts to eat, when he's done eating, when he goes to his wife, when he leaves his wife, there's always a dua. When he looks in the mirror, Allahumma kama hassan khalki fa hassan khuluki. Right? Oh Allah, just as you have made my outward appearance beautiful. Beautify my inward appearance. One time I said that to a brother and he said, well, I'm ugly, so I can't make that dua. <laughs> I said, no, brother. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ Allah has ennobled. As long as you're a human being, whether you're black or white or tall or short or have long hair, short hair, man or woman, you're, you're beautiful, mashallah. Any questions from the sisters? You can write it down if you like to. Yes, sir. Yeah, the thing is, <clears throat> debates are kind of... Um, I don't recommend doing debate. I used to do a lot of debates when I was younger. And it's hard to find people with adab. You know, we can have, you know, um, academic debates at a university. And I continue to do things like that. But many, many people don't have the adab, the, the etiquette for doing uh, debates. Um, uh, you know, Ahmad Didad, rahimahullah ta'ala, um, he was Yanni, mashallah. He's one of my main inspir inspirations. You know Sheikh Khalid Yassin? I spoke to Sheikh Khalid Yassin recently and he told me, Sheikh Khalid Yassin told me that in 1996 he visited Ahmad Didat in Durban and Ahmad Didat told him personally, he said, in America, don't imitate my style. Don't imitate my style. This is what Ahmad Didat told him personally. He said, I bulldozed it. Now you have to plant seeds. <laughs> So, um, you know, we, we, have to, we have to be people of Rahmah. We have to be people of, you know, Ahmad Didat, you know, he was raised in a racist apartheid government where he was picked on on a daily basis. So he had a chip on his shoulder. And he did, did things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's different ways of dealing with problematic Christians, for example, like David Wood or, you know, these people. These people are not very academic to begin with, you know. Um, their main impetus, it seems like, is to denigrate Muslims um, because somehow they may be, um, uh, there might be some financial sort of gain in doing that for them, you know, writing books and things like that, defaming us. Um, so I encourage interfaith dialogue, and it's important that in addition to, in addition to, you know, telling people things that we have in common, we also have to tell them things that we have indifference uh, because a lot of Christians nowadays in particular, um, they're looking for an alternate theology. The, tr the, the Trinity is just not working for a lot of Christians. It's just not working, right? So they love Jesus, which is good, and they love his teaching, and they love Christian ethics. And Christian um, ethical theory is, is beautiful. You know, Thomas Aquinas is very similar to Imam Ghazali and Ibn Sina. In that, in that sense. Uh, but the theology isn't working. So when we present our theology to them, right, many of them become Muslim because it answers their questions. 
but we have to do it in a way with wisdom and with wise exhortation inshallah yes ma'am That's a good question. I'm, I'm sure that there's online academies that have female teachers. If you want to uh, email me, I can give you my information. I can probably find some of those online academies that specialize um, uh, in, in issues related to women that have women scholars, mashayikh that are actually women. Um, but there, there are actually a lot out there. I think, I think we're, we're just kind of oblivious to the resources, but there are actually a lot of online academies out there that have women scholars. Yes. The the only thing that's reliable about Isa alayhi salam is found in the Quran and the sound hadith. So this is what we call uh, a dalil. Uh, if it's in the Quran, it's dalil qat'i, which means that it's a definitive proof. There's no doubt about it. This is this is what Isa alayhi salam said. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what he said. Isa alayhi salam said, a messenger is coming whose name is Ahmad. And even if we can't find a single verse in the entire New Testament where he makes that claim, it doesn't matter to us. Because we know that's true. Because we believe in the Quran. And we believe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is a sadiq al amin and even his enemies they called him a sadiq al amin the enemies actually began calling him the truthful one right uh, so we believe in the quran as the word of god and the quran is not judged against any other book even with that said there are places actually in the new testament where isa alayhi salam does um, seem to indicate a messenger to come after him uh, but we stop where allah and his messenger has stopped and that is sure knowledge after that it's kind of theorizing, right? And that's the realm of the scholar to do that, you know. Um, uh, so what, what the Quran teaches about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, what the Prophet Sallallahu said about the Hawariyun and Isa alayhi salam, that's, that's sure knowledge, that's reliable. How many of the, what's that? Hmm. Yeah, there's there's tens of thousands of hadith. So, you know, we have the tradition of the sound six books, right? Who knows the sound six books? Who's who's under 15 who knows the sound six? Bukhari? Muslim? Ibn Majah? Yeah. And Nasai? At-Tirmidhi? What's the one, last one? Abu Dawood. Yeah. Sunan Abu Dawood. So these are called the sound six. Now there's other books of hadith. You know, Tabarani. Uh, you have uh, Ahmad, right? That contain sound hadith as well. So hadith authentication is a, is a rigorous process. Um, uh, but, you know, Imam, Imam Bukhari, there's some Muslims who believe that if Imam Bukhari didn't say it, then it doesn't exist. I quoted a hadith one time in a, in a khutbah, and the brother, right after the prayer, he stood up and he said, this brother, he quotes hadith that is mawdu'ah, and his aqidah is batil, and, and I said, what hadith are you talking about? And he quoted the hadith, I said, and, and he said, what book of hadith is it? And I said, this is a hadith that's in Al-Bazar. He said, I've never even heard of that. So I said, so what does that mean? It doesn't exist? 
that's a non sequitur argument in logic. So I said to the brother, I said, do you know my cousin Mo? He said, no, but he exists. Just because you don't know him, right? So, uh, you know, even, even Imam Bukhari, and his, we call it Sahih Bukhari, but his title, if you look at the full title, right? Um, like, Umurun Nabi, Umur fi Ayamin Nabi al Mukhtasar. Actually, the word Mukhtasar is included in his title, meaning this is an abridgment of hadith. Imam Bukhari himself admits there are many, many other hadith, but this is just a few hadith, right? Um, but generally speaking, the sound six are considered to be the best books of hadith. Rigorously authenticated. What does it mean for a hadith to be authenticated rigorously? That means it's marfu'r. If it's related to the Prophet ﷺ, marfu'r means that it says, qala Rasulullah, the Prophet said. That's called marfu'r. It's also muttasil, meaning there's no breaks in the chain of transmission. There's no missing links in the sanad of the hadith. Okay, that's called muttasil. Also, uh, everyone in the hadith is identified as being a person of adala, of outward religiosity, of righteousness. Everyone is identified in the hadith as being truthful and being someone who's outwardly at least religious. In the hadith, scholars were very, very meticulous about taking hadith from different people. One of them said, if I see a man standing up and drinking water, I'm not going to take hadith from him. Even though it's totally permissible to stand and drink water. But he wanted to be so stringent, right? Because the Prophet said to them, he wouldn't stand and drink water, he would sit and drink, right? Another one, Imam Bukhari, he went, he walked to another country to get one hadith from a man. He saw the man at a distance, pretending he had food in his hand to trick his horse. And then Imam Bukhari turns around and goes home. He says, I'm not taking hadith from a man who's going to trick an animal. They're so stringent. So not only is the hadith marfu'r, it's muttasil, everyone in the chain has adala. But in, in addition to that, um, everyone in the chain has tam adopt, meaning they have very good memories and are known as being intelligent people, educated people. And in, in addition to that, there's no illa, there's no sort of irregularity in the chain of hadith. So sometimes you might see that so-and-so heard from so-and-so, and both people have adala, and both people have intelligence, but it's just unlikely that these two people might have met because they're from different countries. That affects the authenticity of the hadith. When all of these things are met, then the hadith is graded as sahih. It's very, very stringent. If you want a good book on hadith, I recommend a book by Jonathan Brown who's a Muslim scholar, young scholar. I think he's at Georgetown. It's called Hadith. So Jonathan A.C. Brown, right? Because there are a lot of misconceptions about Hadith. Do we have to follow Hadith? What is a Hadith? Is a Hadith the same as the Quran? Or, you know, which Hadith are authentic, you know? Oh, off topic, but... What is the significance of the different motions of prayer? Rukur and sujood, etc. Yes. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I studied this a while ago and it's not coming to me. But I'm sure maybe the brother knows. Um, and it's okay to say I don't know. Imam Ali used to say, I used to love saying I don't know. <laughs> you know, there was a man in Morocco who traveled by foot. He walked from Morocco to Medina to sit with Imam Malik ibn Anas, just to sit with the Imam. Look how, how much trouble people would go through just to sit with a scholar. Now we have internet. We can connect with scholars like that. We don't do it, right? So he said, he went to Imam Malik ibn Anas, right? The, the codifier of the Maliki school of fiqh the author of al muwatta And he said, I asked Imam Malik 36 questions. 36 questions. His answer to 32 of them was, La adri, Allahu alam. <laughs> and then he answered four. And I went back to Morocco very happy that he answered four of my questions. He answered 32 by saying, I don't know. God knows. And he answered four. <laughs> so I'm using that story as my excuse. <laughs> 
<laughs> Imam Ghazali said, I don't know is half of knowledge. Because <laughs> it's hard to admit you don't know. Right? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, the Jews, uh, it's called kashrut. They actually have a lot more rules and regulations concerning food. Uh, for example, they can't mix meat and dairy at all. So you can't have a cheeseburger ever, right? You have to hold the cheese on the burger. And many other rules like that. There's a lot of different rules about seafood and things like that. Uh, so the Islamic Sharia, it really ameliorates. It really makes it easier, right? Allah says in the Quran that the Prophet Sallallahu He's foretold in the Torah and the Gospel, and he removes from the Ahlul Kitab the heavy yokes that are on their backs. And the Tafsir says, in the form of so many rules and regulations that they made for themselves. Even the Christians, I mean, if you're Catholic, you follow canon law, and there's thousands of rules in canon law. And you have, for example, Protestants, like Methodists, they have a whole code of conduct that they follow. A lot of rules. Don't think, oh, the Christians, they don't have any rules. You have many, many rules. But when it comes to dietary laws, the Christians are very lax, specifically when it comes to dietary laws. Because they do believe that the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, which is their belief, this is from Paul, obviously, Hellenistic Christianity, uh, abrogates, it renders all of the ahkam of the Torah mansukh. All of the ahkam, all the legal rulings of the Old Testament have been abrogated by the death of Jesus. So they can eat whatever they want. Right? Um, but of course, Isa alayhi salam, he followed the uh, prohibitions. <laughs> so, you know, if he's your master, then you should emulate him in that respect. Never ate pork. What's that? The Old Testament is simply one big Christological typology. It's, uh, in other words, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. So the laws that are revealed to the Israelites, they followed them, but then they've been abrogated. Now stories in the Old Testament for Christians, like uh, Pharaoh slaughtering the firstborn of Egypt, that's a typology or a prophecy of what Herod would do in Bethlehem. Moses coming out of Egypt is foreshadowing Jesus coming out of Egypt according to the Gospel of uh, Matthew. Um, so it's one big sort of prophecy of Christ. That's the way they look at the Old Testament. Hijab and Christianity. Orthodox Christian women uh, cover their hair, I guess it says. Uh, sorry, I can't read this. Debate with the, what do they say as to why their women don't even ah, cover their heads? Yeah, so it depends on what Christians you talk to. If you have you ever been to a Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall, probably not because they won't even let you in. But in the Kingdom Halls, uh, the women sit behind the men and they're always wearing hijab and they're not allowed to speak either because the New Testament says that a woman may not speak in church. So they follow the New Testament quite literally. Other Christians have different readings of New Testament. Like for them, Paul's... Um, prescriptions in the New Testament um, are contextualized to those times. They're not universal in that sense. They just have a different way of looking at revelation and scripture than what Muslims do. Uh, but in the in Catholic tradition, uh, the habit, right, nuns wear a habit. And according to which convent they belong to, they don't give you the habit initially. The habit is actually uh, a daraja. It's an actual, it's kind of like a reward that they get when they prove after many years that they're actually dedicated to the convent and then they're awarded with a habit. That's how much they honor the habit or the hijab. So I, I remind my Christian friends, you know, have you ever seen a picture of Mary or an icon of Maryam salam, where she wasn't wearing a hijab, right? You know, in first century Palestine, I said this one time and a woman came up and she was cussing at me. So don't take this the wrong way. This is just the fact I'm telling you right now. That first century Palestine, 
a Jewish woman, a woman that did not wear hijab, was either a Gentile, meaning a non-Jew, or a prostitute. That was just at that time. Don't take this the wrong way. Again, I'm just giving you this historical information. A man without a beard at that time was a Gentile or homosexual. Again, don't take this the wrong way. Okay? Obviously, these things don't cross over to our culture. But just to emphasize to you the importance of the hijab and the beard at that time amongst the people of Isa, alayhi salam. Very, very important. Right? Uh, even if you look at you know Christian movies, Mary Magdalene, whom they believe was a prostitute, there's no evidence she was at all. She might have actually been his wife, the wife of Esau. Esau. But Christian, a pope made a comment, Pope Leo in the 5th century, that she was a prostitute. Before she becomes Christian, her head is uncovered. But suddenly when she becomes a disciple, suddenly she's wearing a hijab. Why? Because it's a symbol of religiously oriented women. Again, I'm not saying women that, that don't wear hijab are prostitutes. Please don't say I'm saying that. I'm just giving you some insight as to the cultural context of the time of Isa al Islam in Palestine. Okay? Um, the New Testament says, Paul says, that <clears throat> uh, a woman who prays with her head uncovered must have her hair shaved. This is New Testament. This is an Old Testament that's been abrogated. This is what Paul says in the New Testament. He also says a woman who speaks in church... Uh, is a it, it, so he says uh, it is a shameful act for a woman to speak in church. This is what Paul says. Let me tell you another one of my very interesting true stories. I was in a church called St. Paul Methodist Church in Fremont, California, and I'm up on the stage. I'm having a dialogue with the pastor. This Christian woman in the back row, uh, who I later found out was a physician. She's very educated. In the middle of my talk, she stands up and starts shouting at me. And all I heard was, Muhammad, 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 like that. So, and I have a microphone, and, you know, I'm not going to get into a shouting match, but I don't want people to hear what she's saying either. So I go, hmm. Right? And then she, you know, she kind of exhausted herself and she sat down. And I was thinking, you know, what did I, I mean, we're just having a nice civil conversation. So I said to her, I said, what is the name of this church that we're in right now? She said, St. Paul Methodist, and don't you forget it. I said, let me quote to you from Paul. Paul says, a woman who speaks in church has done a shameful act. What you just did right now was shameful. He also says, because I saw her earlier praying like this, she went like this, and she was like praying against me or something. I said, a woman who prays with her head uncovered, let's shave her head. This is what Paul says. So I said, please, let's get out the clippers. Let's shave this woman's head. And then she just, she was obsessed. With, she actually was to follow me around to different masajid for months. Where, you know, I'd go to like UC Davis, which is hundreds of miles away, and she would be there at the event. I'd go give a khutbah in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. She's outside the masjid. She would follow me around until one day my dad confronted her. And dad don't play. <laughs> what is the best way to teach our youth, children, teen, and preteen? So uh, Imam Ali said, Alimu awladakum thalasa Teach your children three things. Hubbu uh, Teach your children the love of their prophet. And the love of his family. And the recitation of the Quran. Right? Teach your children the love of the Prophet. That means you have to tell them who the Prophet is. Because that's what's going to really impact them for the rest of their life. If they love the Prophet from a young age, they will continue to love him. Because childhood is when these things are set in stone, right? Um, that's why it's very difficult for, for people when they have these traumatic childhood experiences to move past them because things have been set in stone. So if children's emotions are tied in love to the Prophet wasallam, that will stay there. Love of the Prophet, love of his family, love of the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet wasallam. 
and also reading recite, recitation of the Quran. If they love to recite the Quran, they will continue to recite the Quran, and then they'll learn to the meanings of the Quran, then they'll study the tafsir of the Quran, and then the ulum of the Quran, and they'll stay like that, inshallah ta'ala. There's a lot of wisdom in this saying of Imam Ali, karabalahu wajha. So how do you do it? Um, you know, get your children involved in um, uh, Sunday school, and make sure the, the, the teachers, um, you know, we have a lot of teachers in Sunday schools that are well-intentioned, but they're sort of out of touch with the youth. Right? The youth can't really confide in them. So a good thing to do is put your children in different halakat, where there are younger uh, speakers that, you know, that, can, that were raised in the society and they've sort of dealt with some of the challenges that they're going through, right? That can sort of mentor them. Youth need Muslim mentors, sort of guide them, ask them questions. We, you know, we had a halakha one, you know, a few years ago. And I get questions all the time from youth that they would never ask their parents, you know, brother, I want to do a secret nikah. I'm in L.A. right now, and he's from San Francisco, and I want to do a secret marriage right now. Can I do it? Brother, I want, I'm, a, I'm sitting in, the, in a tattoo parlor right now. Should I do it? You know, this type of thing. Um, so, and they're full of these questions, and they need to have someone who's available who's not going to judge them or scold them in a harsh way. Um, so have them involved uh, in the Sunday school program where they're learning, you know, different ulum ad deen and also uh, look for a mentor that's, you know, not quite as old as you are, but not exactly a child, kind of a go-betweener. Like I'm not really, I'm, I guess I am an uncle, but, you know, with many of the, the high school youth, I'm not old enough to be their, actually I am old enough to be their father. <laughs> Whatever. So I'm sort of a go-betweener, right? So, you know, find people like, you know, that, you know dynamic people that can, that can help your children if they have issues. You, and you have to seek them out and you have to have patience and things like that. Hope that answers the question. Last question. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll do with James first. There's nothing in our sources that mention James, uh, but historical sources mention, Western sources mention, that very early on, even first century, there were two distinct forms of Christianity. There's Jamesonian Christianity, which is more Semitic in its orientation, more Jewish in its orientation. Then you have Pauline Christianity, uh, which is more Hellenistic in its orientation and that these two are in conflict. If you read, for example, the book of Galatians, which is a letter that Paul wrote, uh, Paul has major, major difference of opinion, fundamental difference of opinion with other disciples of Jesus. And you have to ask, you have to ask the question, why is Paul lashing out against these other disciples if they're all Christians and they believe in the same thing? In Galatians, he calls them hypocrites, and he calls them dogs and enemies of the cross, and he identifies who his opponents are. And he says they are Kepha and Yaakov and Yohanan, Peter, James, and John. These are the enemies of Paul, according to Paul. These are disciples of Jesus. So James is the brother of Isa alayhi salam. He's the successor. He's the Khalifa of Isa alayhi salam. In Hebrew, his name is Yaakov Hatsadiq, James the Just, which is very interesting because his laqab, Hat Sadiq is the same laqab as Abu Bakr as Sadiq, <laughs> right? In the Gospel of Thomas, which is rejected by Christians, uh, but very interesting gospel, and I think there's a lot of truth in it. In statement number 12 of the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, When I am gone, you must go to James the just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. James is very, very important, right? So you have these two distinct forms of Christianity. So what happened to the Jamesonian school? The Jamesonian school was eventually declared illegal because Constantine, the Roman emperor, 
he became Christian, and then he instituted Pauline Trinitarian Christianity. And there's no separation of church and state, obviously. So when the Roman emperor says, this is the Christianity that I'm endorsing, all other forms are illegal. So they go underground. That's why they, they keep finding archaeologists. They keep finding these, you know, gospels and writings that have been buried in the sands of Egypt and Syria and so on and so forth. Because these communities, Christian communities, were suddenly declared heretics by Roman imperial edict, right? But that strain of Christianity was revived in Islam. Islam is the, uh, the renewal, the recapitulation of that original Jamesonian Christianity, that Semitic Christianity that was originally preached, preached by Isa alayhi salam. You know. The other question, that's just a brief answer because it's very late. But the next uh, question about uh, the second coming. No, the, the hadith that deal with the Mahdi are weak. But the hadith that deal, many of them are weak. But the hadith that deal with Isa alayhi salam, most of them are very strong. That's why if you read the Aqidah, like Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, he wrote, he wrote the Aqidah al-Tahawiyah. Aqidah is very, very stringent as to what goes into it. So Aqidah is theology. What do Muslims have to believe? Right? Aqidah comes from aqada, which means to tie something. Right? Wahlul uqdatan min lisani. Remove the knot from my tongue. So these are beliefs that are binding upon Muslims. You have to believe in them. Aqidah looks at Quran. It looks at mutawatir uh, hadith. Multiply attested hadith. These are considered dalil qat'i. You have to believe in them. And Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, he mentions the second coming of Isa alayhi salam, which means that the sources for it are very strong. We have to believe in the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. Even though it might not explicitly be mentioned in the Quran, it's multiply attested in hadith. Multiply attested. What does multiple attestation mean? What does it mean for hadith to be mutawatir? It means groups and groups of Muslims from all over the Muslim world are reporting exactly the same statement from the Prophet ﷺ, which would have made it impossible for them to have colluded in order to fabricate a hadith. It's just true, right? It's it would be inconceivable for it to be a lie. Now in the Quran, actually, Isa will speak to the people in childhood and in maturity. Kahlan. And Ibn Jawzi says that uh, kuhuliya, right, which is where you get the word kahlan from, begins at age 35. So Isa alayhi salam has not yet spoken kahlan as a mature person or as an old man sometimes it's translated because he ascended at 33 according to our uh, consensus of belief. Also the Quran says, وَإِنَّهُ لِعِلْمُ sa'ati." that he is a major sign of the sa'a, of the day of judgment. And almost all of the exegetes of the Qur'an say, this is an indication of the ruju' the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. There's, there are things in the Qur'an, but you're right, it's not explicit. But the hadith is multiply attested, so we believe in it. When it comes to the Mahdi, there is a lot of weakness. But we believe in that too, right? But there, there are some, some weaknesses. There's actually a hadith that says the Mahdi will not come. The Mahdi will come when people start saying there's no Mahdi. Right? There's another hadith that says uh, when the Khatib stops mentioning the, the, the Dajjal on the minbar, that's when he's going to come. And that's what's happening right now. People are afraid to talk about these things. They're afraid to talk, you know, talk about the Dajjal and think one eye, what does that mean? And No, 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 brother, no, don't talk about this. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.